Good afternoon, Senator Langley, Representative Richardson, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Education and Cultural Affairs. Good to see you again. Uh, my name is Stephen Bone. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Education. I'm here today representing the Department and the Governor in support of LD 1854, an act to expand educational opportunities for remaining students. Uh, as members of the committee may know, I have two daughters, uh, Catherine, who is nine, and Emily, who is 12. They are both enrolled in the Camden Rockport Public School System, and both are doing extraordinarily well. They get their brains from their mother. <laughs> we are very fortunate that this is so, because they, like all other students, are in the schools and classrooms they are in, grouped for instruction with the other students they are grouped with, and being taught by the educators who are teaching them because of two factors that are totally unrelated to their needs as learners. Along with their classmates, my girls are in the grade levels and classrooms they are in because of their physical ages. If they were a year younger or a year older, they would be in entirely different classrooms with entirely different classmates, taught by entirely different teachers, learning entirely different things. They attend the schools they attend because of our street address. That is the factor that determines where they and most other students attend school. If we live 10 miles in any direction from where we live now, they would be attending school in an entirely different school system. The barriers of time, the way that we group children for instruction based on physical age rather than educational need, we are in the process of overcoming. As this committee well knows, we have schools and districts across Maine that are moving away from the age-based grouping of students towards a system where students move at their own pace based on mastery of learning outcomes. This is a model of education that this committee, with its support for LD 22 has endorsed. The bill before you today seeks to address the barrier of space, the way that a student's physical address determines the educational options to which they have access. It does that by creating what is known as an open enrollment option for our public schools and our approved private schools. Open enrollment is a school choice option available in states across the nation. I have attached to my testimony an inventory of school enrollment, open enrollment policies uh, in each state from the Education Commission of the states. Uh, and is, we believe, a way to expand school choice options to more students in a manageable and fair way. I use the term expand school choice options because it is important as we begin the debate on this bill to acknowledge that thousands of students in Maine have school choice options today. If you live in one of Maine school choice communities, you have school choice options. If you were able to arrange for a superintendent's transfer, a superintendent's agreement by which two superintendents agree to transfer a student from one district to another, you have school choice options. If you come from a family of means who can afford to move to a different school district or can afford private school tuition, you have school choice options. If you are not in one of these groups, however, the school your children attend is determined by the street that you live on. You do not have the choice to send your children to a school that might better meet their educational needs or interests. The school your children attend is determined by lines on a map, which uh, many of which, in this state at least, were drawn centuries ago. The <coughs> bill before you seeks to address this inequity in school choice options by allowing school districts and approved private schools the option of opening their enrollment to students outside their district boundaries. Turning to the bill itself, you will see that we propose to create a new section statute, section 5207 of Title 28, which establishes the main open enrollment program with the goal of the program, which appears at the top of page two of the bill, to expand the publicly funded educational opportunities available to students in the state. The way the program would work out is laid out in the sections of the bill that, that follow that part. School districts could decide whether they want to participate in the program at all or not, and if so, they would need to establish a series of policies, including deciding how many students they are prepared to accept from outside their borders and for which programs or grade levels. They are to make known the number of available slots or to describe their educational programs. And if they are a private school approved for the receipt of public tuition dollars, they are to make clear the amount of any tuition and fees they would charge in excess of what they would receive in tuition funding. It is important to stop here for a moment and note that <clears throat> unlike what we might think of as a voucher type school choice program, an open enrollment model puts schools and school districts in charge. They decide whether to accept students under the program or not, and if so, which programs and grade levels to make available to open enrollment students. They are the ones that control enrollment numbers and, as a result, can budget and plan accordingly. <clears throat> under our proposal, any student in any district in Maine would be allowed to apply to attend any open enrollment school in the state during an enrollment window each spring. If the number of students applying to attend a school exceeds the number of available slots, a random selection process must be used to determine 
which students would be accepted to attend. Open enrollment schools, public or private, may not cherry pick students from other schools and districts. Once enrolled, by which we mean pull out certain kids and, and turn away other kids. Once enrolled, the students uh, must be allowed to attend the school to which he or she has been accepted and would be considered a resident of that district from that point forward. The term resident of the district is an important one because for the purposes of transfers between public schools at least, the law treats that student as if the student actually moved to the new district. As indicated on page four of the bill, once the student has transferred to the new school, the count of the student, which is used to determine state funding, is to transfer as well. As a result, the state allocation for that student will, in the year after the student actually switches schools, transfer to the receiving school. The state's, as the committee knows, the state's count for the purpose of state funding is based on the one from the previous year. The open enrolled student would also be a resident of the new district for the purposes of special education. Page four, the bill contains language that shifts the responsibility for the provision of special education <coughs> services to the new school unit upon the student's enrollment there with the state allocation, including special education, funding following the student there in the second year. In the first year, the receiving district would bill the sending district for special education costs. The bill does not allow, uh, I'm sorry, the bill does allow approved private schools to open their enrollment as well. But as the state does not directly fund private schools and students don't become residents of a private school, the bill treats the situation differently. Private schools could choose to open their enrollment under this program and would have to do as the public schools would have to do, an established number of open slots, accept applications, and use a random selection process to determine enrollment. The count, state count, of the student would remain in the sending school district, which would pay tuition to the private school, just as is done today in school choice communities. Sending districts would retain responsibility for the provision of special education services as they do today at school choice districts and would either contract with the private school to provide those services or make other arrangements. For transfers to both public and private schools, parents are responsible for transportation to the open enrollment school, although open enrollment schools and districts can decide to provide transportation services to students if they wish. I realize that all of this is complex, and I know that the committee did a lot of work of this kind around the charter school bill last session, but we purposefully tried to take the simplest approach possible with this bill, which was to imagine what it would be like if a student was able to overcome the barriers of space that I spoke about earlier, and in the case of a transfer from one public school to another, actually move to the new school district. What would happen is they would become a resident of that district, the new district would have the educational responsibilities that exist under the law, and after a year, the state allocation would follow the student to the new district. There are some issues we'd like to continue to explore with the committee. One of the issues is uh, the issue of minimum receiver districts. Under this model, the state allocation would shift to the new district a year after the student does, but for minimum receivers, state allocation and state subsidy are two very different things. Minimum receivers would, for the most part, get no additional state funding for open enrollment students that they accept because they're minimum receivers. Though the possibility does exist that minimum receiving districts, were they to grow, uh, grow their enrollment over time through the open enrollment process, would one day no longer be minimum receivers because their enrollment would climb to, to a certain amount. Still, it is an issue we'd like to explore further with the committee along with the issue of students coming from open enrollment schools and existing school choice districts. The bill does have one other element that is important to note, and that is that it takes steps to tighten up the existing language on superintendent agreements, making it clear that the only thing that superintendents are to consider with regard to approving transfers between districts is the student's best interest, that is the existing language. When a transfer request from a parent, a uh, superintendent's transfer request from a parent is denied by one or both of the superintendents, parents can appeal that decision to the commissioner. And in my own experience, I've had superintendents tell me confidentially that they have denied transfer requests because they've been instructed by their school boards to do so, which is not something the school boards have the authority to do under law. This language simply makes that element more clear. Uh, school choice is a complex issue, but we believe the bill before you does expand <coughs> options for students in a way that is manageable and fair. Expanding options is the goal of the bill, and we are serious about building a system of education that is designed to meet the needs of all students not just those who live in certain towns or who come from certain families of means. We need to provide students and families with more school options. It is for this reason, these reasons that the Department of Governor's Office is testifying in support of LD 1854, an act to expand education on community main students. I'm happy to take questions the committee may have in well, obviously be available for this session. Thank you, Commissioner Baldwin. Any questions of your commission? Nelson? 
very broad question. Okay. Um, this is a, a complex and radical change in how we deliver and fund public education in the state. We're in the last three weeks of the 120th session. Is there, um, can you give me the compelling reason why we need to pass this legislation in this session rather than waiting until the 126th legislature when we can give some thought and consideration uh, to <coughs> a, a fundamental change in how we run the public education? Well, I would say that. I don't know that it's that fundamental a change what we're proposing here. Uh, what we're trying, what, as I said in my testimony, had we come in here with a school voucher program, for instance, where we were going to stop sending money to school districts and fund parents directly and let them choose and go through that process. In my mind, that would be a significant departure from what we're doing now. What we're doing in this piece of legislation, as I said, is we try to think, how could we, we know that the student is able to pick up and move from one district to another, they have a school choice option and they, and they can exercise that option. So how could we create a program, and this was based on a model in Michigan, uh, and, and Wisconsin was the other state we looked at, uh, where we could, through the law, figure out a way to make it so that the student doesn't actually have to pick up and move to the next district, but we could create a way where they could become, for the purposes of their education, a resident of that new district and those pieces would move. So you're moving the count of the student, you're moving that responsibility of the student to the new district. Uh, and it was, it was a way that we thought that we could expand those options uh, in a way, as I said, that was manageable, uh, that was, I, I didn't feel was a radical departure from, from what we've been doing. We had school choice uh, in, in Maine for generations. Uh, this is a way to provide that school choice option, we think, again, in a manageable way for students that live in districts that are not school choice districts. Uh, it, is a, it is a program that districts uh, and schools can run uh, and manage, uh, and we thought it was, it was something that the governor wanted to put forward in this session, and, and he makes that determination. Um, so we worked uh, to try and get uh, a piece of legislation that we thought was a good step in that direction, but, but was not a radical departure from, from what we've been doing. And would you say that sending uh, tax dollars to private schools is not a radical departure? We've been spending, sending public tax dollars to private schools for generations. Well, we've been sending them to the town academies. Right. Yes, town academies guess, are private. Yes, I understand, private. but they serve as the only. That's that's a unique situation in Maine, I think, with 12 schools uh, that Look, serve as the high school of those communities. Yeah, there's, there's 28 schools in Maine, private schools in Maine, that are approved for the receipt of public It's easy to get the idea. They're private. Okay. Yeah. Rosa Blossom? Just getting going. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you. Um, I have a question on how this works. It's really the structure of it. If school district A gets two thousand dollars per student from the state, but they're spending ten thousand dollars per student, why would they want to open their school? to have more kids come that the local taxpayers come to pick up eight out of the ten thousand dollars. Well, one of the pieces we're gonna to have to dig into for the work session is how that school funding piece would work. And the, the reason we chose a process, we didn't go with a sort of a uh, tuition process where one district would write a tuition check to the other district and went with a shift in allocation model. The way that would work is a district that had uh, made its, met its local mill rate expectation. In other words, they, they met that expectation to established by the law. They get all of the state subsidy once they've met that minimum threshold. That student, once that student transfers, would come with all of that subsidy. Okay, so, and we'll, well, this is, this is complex and we'll have to dig into it. But once a, once a district has to raise a million dollars locally, let's say, and they've done, and they've made that local contribution, then the state subsidy, the state's obligation, once they've met that minimum mill rate expectation, is to pay everything above that within the EPS formula. So that student transfer 
they've met that expectation. That student transferring will come with all of that state subsidy will come with that student. We do have an issue, and, I, and I haven't, we haven't gotten to a good, we've sort of been thinking about how to do this, and this is why I put in the testimony we want to continue to work with you on the element of the minimum receiver districts, because those districts meet their minimum mill rate expectation, and they don't, there is very little subsidy that goes beyond that. So they would be in a position where a student transferred in from another district, they would, that, that student would appear on their account, but would not result in the transfer of, of additional state subsidy allocation, yes, but not subsidy. So we do need to explore what's the best way to do that. Because there is, a, there is the way it's drafted, and we haven't figured out a good way to do this yet. It does put the minimum receiving districts at a disadvantage because they would, unless, as I said in the testimony, you, we are going to, and this is something else we can explore in the work session, you've got minimum receivers districts that are sort of on the bubble, for lack of a better term, that if they had an enrollment growth over time, over a few years as they grew their enrollment in a manageable way, would get their enrollment up to the point where they weren't because of uh, the local funding uh, opportunities and so forth, they will see them receive it. But that's all, those are pieces that we can, we, we need to sort of, just take some more time to work through how that works. Um, but this affects anyone who doesn't get full state funding, pretty much. City of Portland, police fund, after taking out construction, we get $1,700 from the state of Maine for each student. And meanwhile, we spend, we spend well over $10,000. All of the difference is paid for by the taxpayer in the city of Portland. <coughs> if we were to open up and people come from Scarborough or wherever, we would get an additional $1,700. In year two, when they become a resident of our district, We'll, I'll, we'll walk through it in a work session. We can, we can lay out how this will work. We don't, we don't see it working that way. We see a student meet when that, when a district meets that minimum mill rate expectation, the remainder of that subsidy kicks in. We'll, we'll so we haven't got any details on that. We'll, we'll get, we'll, well, it's, I mean, it's in the bill, but not in the, not at the level that we need to talk about. Okay. In the language of the bill, but not the description of how that would work. That leads me to agree with Representative Nelson even more about do we have the time to do the work to it. Right. I understand. Senator Alcom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, welcome. Welcome. Always good to see you. Good to see you. Long time no see you. Yeah. Um, let, I'm going to bring us back in time a little bit. Um, it was your nomination hearing, and you spoke about the Department of Education as you saw it and what you'd like to be different. And one of the things that you said that you were hearing from the field is that the Department of, Department of Education had so many programs, so many initiatives, so many things they were trying to do at once. And the field actually was being overwhelmed by the Department of Education. I might, you know, there was, there was too many things going on. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you a very <coughs> simple question. How have you changed this? How have we changed what? How has the Department of Education changed the many programs, the many initiatives, the many new things that we're asking our field to do? Well, I think what we've tried to do over the past year is uh, work. I mean, we did the listening tour. We've talked to superintendents. We've talked to teachers. Uh, and I think what we did is we've been working on is inventorying sort of those programs and putting all of those pieces into that strategic plan that we laid out a few weeks ago. Maybe it's months ago now. I don't know phases together at this point, but, and sort of establish what are those priority areas that we need to work on and focus on, and try and get some focus for the department of what are the things that we want to work on, and we've talked with the committee about a lot of that stuff. So the next stage of that is the work that we've got to do now, which is focusing on those core things, so the ESEA waiver, for instance, this move to a proficiency-based diploma, um, common core implementation, the move towards the smart balance, the new common assessment issue and focusing some pieces around that. The next piece of the work that we are going to begin in earnest, once the legislative uh, session has concluded, uh, is the zero-based budget initiative, which is sort of, in my mind, the second stage of that, which is going through every single program in the department, everything that we're doing, uh, all the ways that we provide those services to schools, um, 
both looking at it internally from within the department and also working with our, our educational partners about getting some feedback from them. These are the things we need you to, the department to do. These are the things we need you to stop doing. Taking all of those programs and matching them up against the strategic plan and saying, is the, are these things that we're doing advancing these goals or not? Some of those pieces we're going to have to do. I mean, we always are going to have a nutrition program. We're always going to be managing transportation. We're always going to be managing special ed services. And then some of those pieces we're going to do. But what we want to do is, now that we've sort of got some sense of the direction we want to go in, we've got some direction from this committee over the, over the course of this legislative session and pieces that you want as a focus area for us, um, the next step is to begin the work of focusing the agency and point it in the direction of the point with the goal that through the spring, the remainder of the spring and into the summer, uh, we'll be using that zero-based budget process to sort of focus all of those pieces. And so next legislative session, when you're, you're back here again to consider the uh, biennial budget, that biennial budget will be unlike any biennial budget any of us have ever seen before, because it is going to be a zero-based budget in which we're going to be justifying every single piece of work that the agency does. Um, and so that's going to be the opportunity for us to come before this committee and say, here's what our budget is, here are the programs we operate, here's where they are located in state or federal law, here are the ones that we say we believe and our, our educational partners believe are advancing our common goals, and here's the long list, and I anticipate it will be a long list, of statutory pieces and reports and this and that and the other thing that are pieces uh, that we, we feel just don't rise to the same level of priority that others, and we'll probably come back with recommendations to move programs, shut down programs, start new programs, move people from this program to that program, uh, refocus, uh, and, and do some things like that. Uh, and if in the meantime we're able to get support for the Fund for Education Delivery of uh, Fund for Efficient Delivery of Education Services, then we'll have an opportunity to do some regional pieces as well that we think will address some of those issues. So it's, it's an ongoing process, and I think the work to to this point has been to sort of focus those efforts. So uh, trying to listen to your last word on focus, I guess I'm going to ask another question. Sure. Uh, I'm trying to focus uh, our conversation around yeah. this, is that when you went on your listening tour, um, you either inferred or suggested, I believe, that the field didn't necessarily love or have confidence in the role of the Department of Education or just the confidence in the Department of Education. And we heard from you uh, over and over that you know that things needed to change on the fifth floor to a more of a resource mm -hmm. yep. figure out yep. how we create better uh, things on uh, our you know on the state website so it can be more yep. of an exchange of ideas, right. best practices, best yep. models. It's so so I, I I guess I'm just a very simple question. Hopefully it can be yes or no. <laughs> you know me better than that. I know. <laughs> but let's just try. Do you think that you are? Department of Education, you, the governor, are gaining confidence within the field when you bring out a choice bill, you bring out a bill that gets rid of due process, and you get a bill that funds religious funding. Do you think that's what the field is telling you when you went on your listening tour, that these are the three top things that are going to change education in the state of Maine? It's a yes or no question, in my opinion. Well, you did the field, was that what the field asked Well, you? I'm not going to speak to the field, but I will say that one of the things that we heard was People want access to educational options. People want to have choices. People want to be able to send their kids to a school that they may think is a better fit for them. Well, I've, we've heard that. The governor hears that all the time. And so that is a piece of feedback we've got. Representative Maker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, if you're in a school district that already receives tuition students and they choose not to open their enrollment, will that affect them in any way? Because there's some towns in our area that they have a lot of sending schools, but will, if they refuse to open it up, do they lose those students, or, or what happens to them? No, I mean, no, they don't lose those students, because the students in the school choice communities, nothing really will change for them. Uh, and the receiving schools that receive those districts, the kids from those districts can continue to receive those districts. The thing that might change is that you might have another school someplace that decides to open its enrollment that is now another option for those kids. So you might be expanding the, the options to which that, that student has access. Um, but you wouldn't change you, those, those students. It's not as though those students wouldn't be allowed to attend the school that they're already attending, the receiving school that they're already attending from the school choice. To follow that up, 
that so so I'm just going to use my area. Okay. So it, so Calus doesn't open it up to enrollment, but over in East Machias mm -hmm. they do. And you know how they um, are in East Machias. <laughs> <laughs> so if one of my kids in Calus wants to go there, they still can do that if they're accepted at that school, even though they didn't yeah. open the enrollment. Yes, Eastman Chias could decide to open its enrollment. Right. It would say we have room for 25 kids or whatever they would say. Uh, kids would, from any school district around, would apply to go there. Eastman Chias would then use a, the, the process to select which students uh, would go. So that is that is how it would work. Okay, thanks. Mr. McClung? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Alcott was looking for feedback. I know some people that are against some of these bills I've talked to are, are glad we're having these conversations as we talk about kids first. So there's feedback I got. I'm looking at um, what you handed out, and people in the audience probably don't have it. I don't know if you but it had some um, what other states are doing. Yeah. And it just, my mind races sometimes, and it made me think, are we kind of doing this now with the no child left behind in the cases where schools that over a series of years that underperform according to that, at some point, don't they have to send a letter out to their family saying you have the choice of moving to a different school? Is that is that uh, very contrast to this at all? No. That it, well, it's, no, it's not related to this at all. The, well, no, it's not. But is it kind of well, we're already doing something like this? Well, no child for, no child behind requires that schools that get into that certain category, you have to have uh, you open up enrollment to other schools within the district. Right. Um, and of course, for the vast majority of Maine, that's there is no other school. Yeah, you know, food to do, but yeah, most of them don't. Um, one of the pieces of work that we have in front of us is is building a new accountability system <coughs> under the No Child Find waiver. So the question that we're going to have to discuss is uh, schools that we find that for whatever reason are struggling. What kind of pieces are we going to relate? Where are we going to connect to that? Would there be a school choice option? Would you allow that district, you know, some type of other enrollment status or something like that? Uh, but that's all the discussion that we have to have um, over the course of summer as we go back to uh, Washington with some type of a No Child Behind waiver that says, in the, when we identify schools that are struggling, here's what we're going to ask them to do. And that, that might fit into this, but that's, that's a separate discussion. My point was just that we're kind of doing something similar to this now. We're allowing, in some cases, people can move from one school to another. That was my point. Yeah, I mean, if, if, a, if a parent wants to move a child and, and goes to the superintendents and convinces the superintendents that they want to move to another district. This happens all the time. And for the, I think for the, and we don't have good data on this because we sort of get, what, what lands on my desk is the refusals, is when, uh, when one of the more superintendents disagrees, it gets appealed to me. But we know, and I know talking to superintendents, they've got kids going here, there, they, and what, that's why when we, when we were working on this, we said, well, how can we keep this as close to a superintendent's agreement type model as it could be, and this is essentially what it is. The student moves, residency, the lack of a better term, uh, for the purposes of funding and all of the rest of that. And that's that's we tried to mirror that to address that that concern. We didn't want to come in here with a voucher bill where we were going to cut checks to families, and I mean, that is a significant departure from what we're doing. This is a model, as you see on this sheet, that you have in you know, states all over the country. In fact, a lot of states all over the country, districts are required to accept open enrollment for students. Uh, we're not even going that far. Uh, we're saying the districts can decide whether they want to open their enrollment or not. They can't prohibit a kid from leaving to go to an open enrollment school under our under the bill, uh, but they don't have to open their enrollment. And, and the, the state, the, you, as you look down this list, you'll see I want to say it's 17 or 18 states where it's mandatory. They have to let kids come and go, and they have to take kids who want to come from other districts. Thank you, Senator Alcorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, have you uh, done? Any sort of survey or any sort of kind of even loose sample uh, of all of our districts to see how many people would be interested in this type of open enrollment? Not. Okay, so I'm intrigued by that answer because in your in your written testimony you you, you see a couple times that you want this to really be a system that it doesn't matter which town you live in or, or, or if you come from a family of means. So. Let's play this out. Let's, okay. let's, let's play out. And we actually, I think, have a pretty interesting uh, potential uh, example with consolidation. How many schools down in southern Maine chose to consolidate? 
How many schools? Yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, how many districts had really consolidated? And not many, I'll, I'll answer for you. Because okay. they, they, decided, <laughs> they decided, you know, the Falmouth or they had the school enrollment high enough. They said, you know what, we're yeah. doing it ourselves. So let's play this That's out. So we're, we're going to create, we're, you know, let's say that the majority party and governor bulldoze this through and bulldoze it through the field and just say, you know what, we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. And then, because you have put in, which I think is fair, that each community can decide whether they want to become an open enrollment mm -hmm. school. So let's say that there's actually very few schools that actually do it. And, and so, so then you're actually, what kind of public policy are we trying to push? If we have no sample, we haven't done any sort of you know, review, we haven't even done something where you could send out you know, a very simple thing, would your school district be interested in this? We, I mean, you can't even give me that at all. So then, so that's one piece of it that I don't think we usually have. We don't really have any idea whether this would be implemented well or even exercised at all by many of our schools. The second piece is, how can you come, how can you say that? Is there a question in that first Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you, we're, we're getting dialogue. Okay. okay. So the, the, the other the Dialogue piece, implies, yeah. you know, right. it's going both on top of it. I answered the first one for you. Okay, all right. I right. 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 I'll give you that. Right, Commissioner? Right. Right. Okay, so the second Isn't it true? Yes. Yeah. 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 So I'm trying to understand how this this is being kind of promoted as helping low-income families. So you have an open enrollment school, mm -hmm. and that school is 20 or 30 miles away from the nearest school, which happens all the time here in the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. And you have, you're, you come from a low-income family. How is this bill changing your option? You can't get to that school. Right now, the, the, the district that becomes an open enrollment school doesn't have to provide transportation. So you haven't, given, you haven't, you haven't given me, if I, in that situation, any more choice at all. But yet, in your testimony, you, you, you claim that this is going to end that, that you, know, it does, you don't just have to be a, you know, come from a family of means. I, I, mean, I don't think I possible? claim that this would end that. Okay, so and, then how would it you're, What you're doing is you're, you're making the perfect the enemy to good here. The goal is to provide more options. We're not going to be able to, I mean, and we discussed this as part of developing this bill. You, you're not going to get to a point where you can have a student go to any school that they want to go to anywhere in the state and make that workable. So the goal here is to put an option on the table, to create another opportunity in the law besides superintendent's transfers and, and sort of the school choice pieces that we have for certain communities, and to put one other piece in the law that could potentially create options for students. Now, if you want to discuss how we could include transportation funding and address that transportation funding and talk about that, we, I'm certainly happy to talk about that. Uh, but the goal is to create an additional couple of opportunities for, for kids that they don't already have. Uh, and we know that, in, that students in school choice communities go to schools all over the place. I mean, I grew up in the town of Penobscot. You don't have a high school. It's a school choice community. And kids from Penobscot went to George Stevens. They went to Ellsworth. They went to John Bass. They went to Bucksport. They went to Searsport. We had kids going all over the place. You talk to you talk to the folks at John Bass. They've got kids from I want to say 50 some odd different communities. Somehow, without any transportation funding, getting their way to John Bass uh, to go there. And I think you'd find a lot of the pub, the superintendents that are here, could tell you they've got a lot of kids coming in from different communities around. So, uh, you know, we're we're trying to we're trying to improve the situation and improve the number of choices. We're not going to get all the way to the kid gets up in the morning and there's a bus waiting to take them to their school 75 miles away um, because that's the better fit. But this is a one step closer to providing a few more options for kids in the hope that one of them will be one that is, is going to be a great fit for that student. Mm -hmm. And I would just suggest that you know, for those school choice communities and for those communities that are trying to work very hard to create multiple pathways, mm -hmm for those communities that are trying to create standards-based education systems, for those communities that are trying to do great RTI systems, that um, they have a, a lot on their plates without trying to create a funding system that we have no idea yet what that will be, and also you know, coming up this late you know, uh, session. So I would agree that you know there is a lot to this bill, would you agree to that? There's a lot to this bill. There's a lot, but I've seen this committee tackle. <laughs> and, I, and you did bring up an important point, which is you, you do have districts that are doing different things. We have districts doing 
standards-based education, moving very aggressively on that, but not all districts. And it may well be a student lives in a community with four or five districts around, one of which is moving in that direction towards a proficiency-based model. They're very interested in that. That district may decide, that's district's board, the schools don't decide individually, the school boards decide, to open its enrollment and students can say, all right, you know, they're, they're not doing that here, they're doing it over there, that's the school I want to go to. And the reverse may be true, that there may be families in that community that say, you know what, the standards-based thing, I don't get it, I don't understand it, this community's not doing that, so I prefer to have my student there. And you're just creating some more opportunities there. There's some love to it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Maker brought up a different area of the state, the rural name. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what happens if you've got a small high school and they're in between two larger school districts? Two larger districts both offer football, let's say. Smaller school doesn't. Let's say 10 students go to one of the other high schools and 10 go to the other. You lost 20 kids. If you only had 100 to start with, are you in danger of losing that school or that community? Well, the presumption of your, your case is that no kids are going back into that school. And you're saying that because those two big schools have football teams, they're going to they're going to be a net loser out of this equation. When I think we know that there are schools that may try some different things and may take different approaches. A good example might be um, Castro Bay, for instance. You might have a, a high school that's trying to decide because it is among a bunch of schools that have a lot of other different things to offer to try something innovative, to try an exploratory type model or, or a standards-based model or something like that as a way to attract those kids. Now, maybe they aren't going to be the football team, and maybe the kids who want to play football will apply if those other districts decide they're open to enrollment, and if they go through the, the random selection process, they could get into those other schools. But that doesn't, nothing precludes that school, that smaller school, from doing something different, doing something innovative, trying something new, taking advantage of the, of the innovation law that we passed last session, allows them to do some innovative things, and attract kids going the other way. I had this discussion yesterday about my Monoset Elementary School, my alma mater, I believe, Monoset got Maine. Far, declining enrollment, 140 some odd kids when I was there, now there's 60 some. So, you know, what's their choice? If the districts around them open their enrollment, what do they do? Well, they could open their enrollment and they could try to do some different things and attract kids into that school. Right now, they, they are trapped because, for whatever reason, and I don't care to go into this, the people in Monoset are not having enough kids to keep a, a high population of enrollment into that school. They are locked into that. They are, they, that school is being driven by the demographics of that community. And what this bill does is it says to Penal Scott, you have an opportunity here to open your enrollment. You have room for 20 more kids at that school? They do. They could open their enrollment, and maybe they do something innovative and different, and kids from Castine, and kids from Blue Hill, and kids from Orland, and kids from Bucksport are able to come to that school. So I don't, I don't, by that this is going to necessarily doom certain schools that have certain characteristics uh, because you're giving families a, a little bit more choice than they have now. But if the surrounding school districts offer more programs and more things going on for kids, you know, they, maybe they offer Spanish, food. I don't know. But those larger districts have more resources to fund a greater program selection, plus sports. Right. You know, doesn't it seem logical to you <clears throat> that more people would want to move their kids where there's a greater selection? Yeah. We've got we've got small private schools and public schools around the state that are doing innovative things that have different kinds of approaches and that are attracting kids in, not because they've got all kinds of programs and they've got the photography, this and the dance and the art and this and that and the other thing but because maybe they focus really, really well on a handful of things. Maybe they're integrating technology in a new kind of way. Maybe they're taking some other kind of, you know, they're focused on performing arts in some way or, or something like that. So I, I, I mean, the decision, the decision will have to be made locally, what do we do? Uh, and so it may be that the decision is, well, we don't really want to do anything and, and we're just going to leave it the way it is. And you do run, and if you don't open your enrollment, you do run the risk that it's time those surrounding districts that have more to offer are going to start pulling those kids out. So the question is, how do you respond to that? And if you're, you know, if I was running this, if I was on the school board, I'd say, let's get some really good things going on in here. Let's do some things that are different. Let's figure out what those other schools aren't offering. 
uh, and put together a program that is really, really strong in those areas. And we've got a bus fleet out here, so let's offer to go get the kids in those communities and bring them over here. And let's 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 uh, set up a school that's really going to do something and attract some kids in here from from outside the district. With even less resources than they have now, but why would they have less resources? When you lose those kids, they lose the money coming from the state. Right, but they'd be gaining students also. So you don't think this would have any adverse impact on the schools? <laughs> what I'm saying is, the adverse impact is going to be determined by what the choices that the school makes. If the school decides the same way we've been doing things for 30 years, it's working just fine, and yeah, maybe those kids want to go and take the art course in the school next door, let them, good, good riddance. I mean, if, if that's the decision, then over time, you are probably right. If they don't respond to the fact that there are educational opportunities in other districts that are attracting students, then they are going to see a continuing decline of enrollment. If, on the other hand, they respond and respond to an opportunity that they now have to do some different things and attract some students in by doing things different, then they'll attract those kids in and they'll have kids going the other way. I mean, you know, I, I started my teaching career in a massive county school system, a county level school system. And you had schools doing all kinds of different things. And you did have kids moving around. We didn't have these, there was 165,000 kids in that school district. We didn't have these lines on the ground, not even on the ground, the lines aren't even on the ground, the lines are on maps, that said, we're going to educate the kids right up to this line here, and everybody else is going to go over there. But they made efforts to make sure that, it, that they could specialize and the school could focus on something. They could pull kids over here. I remember when I was there, there was, a, there was an elementary school that moved to a year-round school calendar. And they said to parents in the area, here's what we're going to do. We're going to experiment with something new. We're going to, instead of taking the whole run, we're going to break it up. We're going to do three weeks of chunks off here, and another one here, and another one here. We're going to move to a, a year-round model. And parents, if those of you that we serve in this community, if you want that, we'll come get you. If not, these other schools will take their kids, and those schools can send their kids over here because we're going to try this new thing, and it worked out. We just we, we get so hung up on these lines that are on the map back here that the lines are what's going to dictate where these kids go to school. Why can't we build some flexibility into this system and let these kids move around to different educational opportunities? Why do the lines have to run the show around here? But did you say your lines were in my county there? It was a county line, yeah. But it was a county of 165 okay. Thank you. You are. Um, we will have some more next. Thank you. And we would make Maine the 180,000. We absolutely could do that. System. Mm -hmm. If we did that, we have to figure out another way to fund education. Because <coughs> the way we fund education now is through property taxes. More than half of our funding right. is through property taxes. Right. Because we've never gotten to more than half of our funding. So I, I think that um, this is a very, uh, it's, and maybe that's the way we should go. But that's a very big discussion. And I think that's a very big dialogue of having one school district. The that's, state of, that's the state of Hawaii is one school district. Right. I'm not proposing one school district. I know you're not. Okay. All right. But what I'm saying, you brought up a, uh, your own mm -hmm. example of 165,000 mm -hmm. student school district. So we could say that Maine is 180,000 school district. And you have a lot of school boards that were very upset by that. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are, uh, one of the things that I would like, I would appreciate if you could bring to the work session. Mm -hmm. Um, you said that you only know the superintendent's agreements that are are sent to you because there's a disagreement. If you could find out for us how many superintendent's agreements are there, how many kids are moving between um, districts on a superintendent's agreement, that would be very helpful Thank for me. Um, the, the other question which I just would ask you to think about if you had, you described a situation where a school system may have a standards-based education and they decide to open up and be an open enrollment school. And people in the surrounding district then who want that kind of an education for their kid have the opportunity to send their child to that school. The student would have the opportunity to, to, to apply enroll. to enroll. Right. If the surrounding communities 
are not choice communities. <coughs> the kids in that standards-based school for whom the parents don't like that don't have the same choice. Correct. Is that correct? That is correct. If okay. those surrounding communities do not open, to create an open enrollment process of their own, then it's a one-way street. So, uh, I see some difficulties with that uh, in how we have schools, if we were to go down this path, how you make sure that what your goal is, is to have open choice for all kids. Well, the way to do that is to do what the 17, 18 other states have done and require that all school districts open their enrollment. And that why would be did the you only not suggest that? Because we wanted to respect that local control uh, and allow districts to be able to decide whether this was something they wanted to do or not. Uh, maybe they're at passive. Maybe they, you know, for whatever reason, they don't want to. They don't want to have whatever they're uh, doing be available to other schools. I mean, it, it, we wanted to keep that as a local option. I think over time, I'm liking the discussion we were just having, with Senator Lovejoy, Reverend Lovejoy. The over time, I think that pressure will mount, though. I mean, if you're the if you have one open enrollment district surrounded by non-open enrollment districts, then over time, potentially, unless kids don't want to go to the open enrollment district or whatever, you're going to have kids going. So I think your districts that don't open their enrollment will, over time, be under some pressure to respond in some way. I would think, unless for whatever reason everything's just on the way it is, and they've got their kids and they they can project rising enrollment in the years forward or constant enrollment and they. You know, for their, it, it works, it works. Well, um, I we in my to... community, and I can't think of a reason. I mean, we, we have capacity issues down yeah. with new schools right. because we have more kids than, right. we, you know. So right. I can't imagine that it would be in our interest to, to open enroll them. Um, but, um, uh, but that's a decision the board would make. Okay. And maybe they decide they want to start a new program or something, a new foreign language program, let's say, or something. And, they, and they, they, because they could say, we're going to start a new Mandarin Chinese program at your, at your school. And we don't think there's going to be enough kids in our district to take Mandarin Chinese. So for that program only, we're going to open our enrollment to these other districts. Okay? This is not, yeah. Yeah, you can set, we can say we're going to take eighth grade. That's it. We only, we have, we have five eighth grade slots. Or we have ten slots for the front row. Or, you know, the grade level, by grade level. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I understand that as the sponsor of this bill, I'm not uh, one to question in the uh, the uh, presenters, but uh, I would ask that our committee uh, be considerate of the dozens of people that have come here to provide testimony, and we can certainly keep the commissioner here or his staff here during the work session as long as our little hearts desire. Thank you, Representative. I'm used to it. President Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very quick questions. Uh, in leaving one of the other bills, the student is in the, has transferred or is in the most school. And or a sibling wants to do it as well, you have that as one as being a priority. Is that, yes. is they, that they, in this bill as well? Yeah, there would be a preference. There would be a preference. A sibling would have a preference mm -hmm. if they chose to, if they chose to enroll. Okay. And that I'll enrollment find process. that in here somewhere? Yeah. I'll, I'll, so uh, don't worry about it. I'll find it. Yep. Secondly, what are the criteria that you would expect to use as an issue to overturn a, a, a superintendent's uh, decision to reject the uh, decision? Uh, well, we're, the, the the law says now is the student's best interest. That's 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 what exists in the law, and what this is written in response to my experience, where I've had what happens is we get an appeal. Buzz Castic, who handles this for the department, gets on the phone, calls both superintendent, says what's going on with this kid, prepares a report for me, and oftentimes we'll get. A report that says, "Look, the board doesn't. I'm not. I, the board doesn't want me to approve any of these transfers. So what do we have to say?" And that's that's not what the policy says. A superintendent's transfer is the authority of the superintendent exclusively. The board, under statute, has no authority with regard to superintendent's agreement, uh, transfer agreements, and they can't establish any policy with regard to that. 
The superintendents have the authority, and there's one criteria that they're supposed to look at, and that's what is in the best interest of the child. And as I said, most of these go fine. I, I don't. I get a chunk sort of late spring and into the summer, but I, I don't remember the last superintendent's appeal that I got. It's been months. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't, because you'd have these other enrollment opportunities, you wouldn't have to rely on the superintendent's committee to do that. Thank you, Commissioner. Any further questions? Commissioner? Seeing none, thank you very much.